We're in the interview portion of today's show. We're joined by legend Jerry Springer. Jerry, what's going on, my man? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, life is good. I'm, I'm very lucky. And, uh, you know, now that we can be let outdoors again, um, it's even better. Of course, you have it tougher here in, in Chicago area because, uh, you know, our home is in Sarasota. So, oh, gosh, it got down to 82 yesterday. It was horrible. Um, <laughs> yeah. Rub it in. But, rub it but in. I, but, yeah, but I, I, I feel for you guys. No, so you're coming to us from Evanston. You know, is it fair to say you got a little Evanston in your blood, Northwestern guy? That makes you the second Northwestern guy on the show right now. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ironically oh. enough, um, Jerry, so I hopped on about 8.45 onto the Zoom, and you at about 8.50, uh, uh, Jerry hopped on. I'm like, oh, here we are. So we talked a little Wildcat football. Um, says he checks the box scores here and there after every game uh, that they were also terrible back when he was in law school there. But uh, Evans is in his blood. Chicago's in his blood. The Jerry Springer yeah. show is Chicago. Well, we did it here. Right. We were here for 20 years. And uh, it, it, but what I mean, obviously, this is such a great city and it had such great ethnic, it has such great ethnic diversity that it really helped our show. I mean, it's, you know, it's a cross section of America here. So that's one of the reasons, you know, when they said they wanted to move the show to Connecticut, where we then moved to uh, Stanford, I was concerned because I didn't think, you know, we're never going to find uh, the audience and the guests, you know, in, in a small town of Stanford. What I didn't realize at the time when they first told me is that it's basically a suburb of New York City. So, um, you know, the show, as it turned out, didn't suffer when it moved east. Uh, but we had great years here. You know, I, as I, I went to law school here, we were 20 years with the show here. Our daughter and our husband and our grandson live here. And when it comes to sports and Chicago sports, um, my biggest thrill was last Saturday um, because my 12-year-old grandson uh, plays on plays travel baseball and he's very serious about it. But he's only 12 years old. And as I was driving him to the game, he said, Opa, um, you know, I've, I've never hit a ball over the fence. Um, and I said, well, you're growing up. And in a couple of years, you keep swinging as you are. You, you'll be able to. And the center field fence in the park they were playing in, uh, and it was a real baseball field, uh, 250 feet in center field. And they're losing two to nothing. And up comes Richard, bases loaded. I'm not making this up. And boom, 270 feet over the 250 marker in center field into the trees. Grand slam, they win the game. It was the single happiest moment of my life. No. I went crazy. <laughs> Just oh, to Richard. put that into perspective, the Little League World Series that we all watch on ESPN, I believe that fence was just, well, not just recently, like years ago now, uh, moved from 200 feet to 225 feet. So if he's hitting a ball 250 plus for a 12-year-old, that's an absolute bomb. Yeah, now he's now he's tall. He's five foot six and he's only 12. So he, he's going to be well into the six feet something. But can he throw a change? Can he throw a change up? Is he interested in getting a pitching lesson from White Sox Dave? Uh, I'll set it up. Uh, no, he, he throws very hard because he's so big and, you know, so they have him pitch just because at that age, the kids can't hit a fastball. Uh, but uh, at some point, look, he better make it because I'm counting on him to support me. Yeah, you got to live vicariously through him. Isn't that every grandfather and father's dream to live vicariously oh, through their son? It is, and I admit it. I admit it. He's everything I wanted to be and couldn't be. Now, I, I, I got to confess, and it's crazy to do it here on your show, but I grew up in New York, so I, I grew up with the Yankees. And uh, it's the only part of being a Yankee fan. It's the only part of me that's Republican. You know, pinstripe suits, you buy everything. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm a you know, liberal dem. But, he's, but, uh, but I'm a Yankee fan, and he, Richard understands, even though he lives here and he's a Cubs fan, he understands that uh, I showed him a copy of my will and there's one line that I haven't filled in yet. Uh, and that's what he gets. And that is dependent on him being a Yankee fan. Or if he ever signs a contract, he has to play with the Yankees. So, uh, you know, I keep telling him, Richard, you know, <laughs> your choice. Hey, 
Do that's it, that's Do hardcore it. fandom right there to basically yeah. uh, what's it, not sabotage uh, take take your son's fandom hostage. Yeah, or your grandson rather, which is oh. funny. And, yeah, um, I, I'll sorry. tell you how sick it is. I grew up in the I came to America when I was five and it was the ni- 1949. So in the 1950s, uh, it was the Yankees were Mickey Mantle, yep. uh, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, the whole bit. So um, Yogi Berra, uh, Mickey Mantle was my Yogi Berra was my favorite player, but I couldn't find a girl named Yogi. So I married Mickey. So my <laughs> wife, my wife's name is Mickey. And oh, She's tired of that joke. Yeah, but it's true. Her name is Mickey. <laughs> the only reason you married her is because yeah. you loved Mickey Mantle. Yeah. I, uh, uh, Jerry, you said your your grandson lives in the Chicagoland area? Yes. Okay, so you're, he's 12, which means he was seven when the Cubs won the World Series, and you're still not going to let him enjoy that? I feel like that's what I let him enjoy that. I We even got tickets to the game. I, I certainly let him enjoy it. I'm, because I, you know, otherwise you get picked up by family services. It'd be abusive <laughs> to not let him enjoy that moment. So, and I told him, you you enjoy it because it's another hundred years because, before you'll that's right you'll have it again. So enjoy it. And uh, yeah, it was actually that was a great moment. It was a one. Yeah, it was wonderful. My Jerry. Chicago sports were though were the, the Bulls. Because in the 1990s, we had season tickets to the Bulls, the Jordan era. And that was phenomenal. I mean, that was, you Did know, a lot of see, those guys go to the show, get a little horned up. They, they used to come out all, virtually all of them. Yeah. But it's not just it's not just <laughs> all of them. We taped during the day and whether it was baseball, uh, basketball or football or hockey during the day the the guys don't play. So all the visiting team always came to the show. I mean, I'm serious. A third of virtually every audience were ball players, And uh, we had some step in as security to help Steve out. Uh, but then we heard from the management that they can't do that because can you imagine? Oh, they'd be canceled if, right now. <laughs> some of oh get God. hurt. Yeah. Uh, if, Bob, you know, Bob Probert's running your security. Yeah. yeah, but if one of one of the players, you know, got in a tumble and hurt his arm and was out, had to miss his next start. Oh my God, that really that would have been a career ender. Jerry, we had Steve on last week, and we asked him, like, "Do you have one question for Jerry?" He's like, "Yeah, ask him if it sucks that like flying commercial now. Like, I got so used to flying private with him. He's like, I hate flying commercial." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah, it. Uh, but no, I'm. I'm okay with you yeah, for 27 years or whatever. I, I had a plane and that was obviously that was really very nice, but I needed it because I had shows in different parts of the country. So I literally couldn't take those other jobs because you can't trust the airline going to whatever city you need to go to for that day. Um, so I had one, but now I, I, I don't have it anymore. And uh, so the first time I got on the, uh, commercial plane it was outrageous i mean you're not going to believe this i got on the plane and there were other people on it <laughs> what the I horrors said, right me. i said excuse me i ordered this plane here's my ticket but no you yeah so <laughs> it's good it's good jerry what was uh tell us who was the producer or what was it like when they're like hey here's what the show is going to be now it's going to be this crazy thing where we just, you know, have all these characters come out. What, what was, what was your reaction, and how was that pitched to you? Well, I'll tell you how it came. First of all, Richard Dominic was the producer then, and uh, after that, uh, Steve's wife uh, was my producer, uh, Rochelle. So, in fact, they met on my show, and uh, so you know we're great friends and et-, et cetera. But how the show got to be crazy. Um, the first two or three years, it was kind of a normal talk show, pretty boring, but, you know, just normal show. But all the shows back then, there were 20 talk shows in the early 90s. And every one of them wanted to be like Oprah and uh, to appeal to the demographic, which at that time was referred to as middle aged housewives. And then along came Ricky Lake. And she really had the first show that went after the kids. And when I say kids, I mean, high school, college age. And. I was walking down Michigan Avenue. I vividly remember it. 
uh, with Richard Dominic, a senior producer, uh, executive producer, and we're walking down. And I said, you know, as a business model, why are we trying to be one out of 20 shows competing with Oprah, which we would never win in a 20? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why don't we go after Ricky Lake's audience, which is just then we'll be one out of two and we'll get a much larger piece of the pie. So starting literally the very next day, we had only young people in the audience, young people on stage, young subject matter. Well, as you know, young people are much more open about their lifestyles, much more, you know, much wilder, crazier, whatever. So every once in a while, not every day, but every once in a while, it would get really over the top. Then uh, Universal bought us. And when Universal bought us, they said, from now on, we can only do crazy. And that's how it started. It was about three and a half years in. From then on, it was only crazy. There were always fights. Well, you know what the show became. And that's when we passed Oprah. And that's when the show went over the top. So it was pure. The the day you beat Oprah? Do you remember the day you beat Oprah? Was that like like, astounding? Did you guys throw a party? What was the deal there? Uh, Probably. But it, it, it was, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. You, you see it gradually. Your ratings are starting to go higher and higher and higher. And then people start saying, oh, we're good. So, yeah, I think I don't remember the exact day, but they probably were a bunch of toasts and probably went out afterwards for drinks. Which Was, th- was there a it- holy shit moment as you guys were kind of ascending in stardom and in ratings and beating an Oprah and all that where you're like, wow, we got something big here. Like we have, uh-huh. we have a phenomenon right now. Well, for me personally, uh, you know, I've never taken the show seriously. I mean, I'm, I was happy to do it and it was fun to do, but it was mindless. I mean, the show was stupid, <laughs> um, but I, you know, it was fun to do. Uh, but the, the moment that it kind of hit me that, you know, there's a reason people, let's say, would be going Jerry, Jerry was saying hi to me and all that. Um, when I was on the cover of Rolling Stone and when I was on the Simpsons, those two Mm -hmm. things, because they were cultural. Right. And then, uh, then I realized that this, this Jerry Springer was an entity separate from me. In other words, I still have the same four friends that I grew up with, you know, uh, plus Steve. (laughs) So I have four (laughs) plus one, but you know, I don't, my circle, I, I don't, hang around celebrities. I mean, I don't know any. I don't have the phone number of any. Um, so basically, my life has always been kind of separate and private from my public life. And yet that's when I first realized that, you know, this this is a pretty significant product of this of the culture, not a good one. You know, I, I've ruined Western civilization. You know, <laughs> I remember that. I, and, you know, I don't know when the chance started. Their show, show started in 91, I believe. But Jerry, has a day gone by where people have not chanted your name and you on the street to even today in 20? Yeah, like in the grocery yeah, like, store no. picking when, up milk. When you, get on the, when you get on the public pr- plane, do they chant Jerry, Jerry from? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> and the the pilot over the uh, PA system, you know, when he says mm-hmm. how long the flight's going to be. And uh, they'll say things like the chairs of your seats are buckled down. So don't be throwing them. They'll make some reference, you know, when the flight, when they land and the flight's over, they said, take care of yourself and each other. They will, you know, and um, so, yeah, but people are always nice. You would think with such a controversial show that, you know, I've run into a lot of anger in people. Uh, Never. I mean, you know, if people don't, in politics, people don't like you, uh, you know, because you have different views and they get very angry. But in show business, if they don't like your show, they don't watch it. I mean, no one goes around hating somebody because they saw them in a movie and they didn't like the role they were playing. You know what I mean? It's, so it's it's always nice. It's all that people are always friendly, but I don't take it. You know, if someone I know says I love you, like my wife and child, et cetera, and grandson, that means something. You know, if, if kids are just chanting, hey, Jerry, Jerry, love you, man. I don't go home at night and say, oh, man, am I loved. You know, I've got a mirror and that keeps that'll keep anyone humble. Eh, you shouldn't sell yourself short. I mean, 30 years oh. almost with the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> yeah, but I, I didn't do anything. But I didn't do anything. 
I know the show was successful, but let's be honest. To be a talk show host, you only need three lines, which are, you did what? Come on out. We'll be right back. If you <laughs> could say those three lines, you're a talk show host. That will be right back just triggered me. You spent so many of my days as a young man, like at home Dipping school with you, Jerry. And just the way yeah. you just said, we'll be, we'll be right back, like just triggered me a little bit uh, in a good way. What was there any different? Was there any difference when you left Chicago with the crowd? I thought there would be, uh, but there wasn't because the what Stanford, Connecticut is is like twenty minutes on the next train stop from New York City, so it, it, the same ethnic diversity, same, and the East Coast has tons of colleges right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we get the college students from Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey. I mean, we, you know, it, and it became, as you kind of referred to when you were younger, um, if you're in college, that was the thing to do. I mean, you didn't have to, you know, want to watch the show every day. But if you're in the dorm and one of the guys says, hey, man, I got four tickets to spring. You want to go? Hell yeah. You know, it, it was a fun time. And I get that. It wouldn't be a show that I watch because I'm 77. But for young people, if, when I was in college, I would have watched it. There's no question. I would have loved it. So, yeah. so, but so no, I didn't notice a difference in the audience. And then now, honest to God, having a political background and, and being the, you know, being the mayor of Cincinnati before this, having like a political professional background, was there, is there like frustration where you're like, well, now all I have to do is roll out these you know, creatures these, said. Yeah, these creatures. Now I've captivated the young audience. I have their attention. Heaven fucking forbid if you were trying to have a serious conversation, though. Like, is that something that crossed your mind while you're doing this? Well, it, it did. But <clears throat> I always kept my politics separate from the show. In other words, I've remained very active politically. You know, I, I give speeches around the country. I raise money. Uh, I have a political podcast uh, you know, once a week. So I, I'm very active politically, but I never mixed my politics with my showbiz uh, because it would ruin either. In other words, if I started in the middle of my show to talk about serious political issues, number one, nobody would take it seriously because it was in the middle of my show. And two, it would turn off the people that are there because they don't want to hear politics. They want to have a good time with the craziness of the show. And in politics, if I talked about the show, people wouldn't take what I was saying politically seriously. So I always have kept them separate and it, it has worked. There was a time in uh, 2004 and 2006 that I had given serious thought um, to leaving the show and uh, running it for, for the a, a Senate in uh, 04 of Ohio and governor of Ohio in, uh, in 06. And that was because the Democratic Party came to me and they had polls which showed, I'm not saying it would have lasted, but that I was comfortably uh, leading, that I would, you know, that I would win. And that made me think, wow, and I concluded that um, I just family obligations, stuff like that. It was I was at a point in my life. If I were young, I would have done it in a heartbeat. It, it's the simple answer. Uh, but at my age, you know, it's time for younger people. Well, Did you I mean, I don't think that that's true. Everybody being old is in. Everybody. Yeah, old. Just yeah, well, Ryan. <laughs> well, I'm I'm learning TikTok. So okay, uh, there you go. You're on your uh, way. Yeah. <laughs> my gra my grandson is teaching me things, and I have no idea what they mean. But uh, <laughs> mean anything? last night he was showing me that. Jeez. So uh, you know, yeah. so I'm a little behind, but I'm I'm kind of learning. Richard it. hits dingers and he Bus knows TikTok. Bussin, bussin. That's another one. <laughs> Jerry, Richard. I want to ask. I think this is a question that a lot of people have about your show. Was there anything ever that one of the uh, cast members um, ever pulled or ever did that was like that made you go like, whoa, like this wasn't in the script and I was really, really messed up where you're like giving it pause or is there anything that sticks out to you like that? Well, uh, just to let you know, I never there's no script. 
And I was never allowed to know what the show was about. So they, I always held the card. You saw me walking around with the card. And all the card has on it are the names of the guests. And my job was to go out there, ask questions that you would be asking sitting at home, and then make jokes. But I was never allowed because they thought if I knew what the show was about or what these guests would be saying, then any reaction I had would be fake. Right. So the whole idea was no. So I was never disappointed. I, I knew they'd send me something stupid every day. And but I would just have to make jokes. But no, I never knew what the show was about. I had no involvement in any of that. And it made the show better, to be honest. It was more authentic. Did you ever have anyone in the media back then that kind of villainized you because of the style of the show? Was there anyone who was oh, really after I think, you? I think most did. Uh, you know, I think the general, you know, in the beginning, the show was so controversial. I mean, it, I, there has never, ever been anything on our show that isn't already in the Bible, isn't already in literature, isn't already in Shakespeare. I mean, the issues have been with us forever. But we had never seen them on television before in 1991. You know, if it was a married couple, they slept in separate beds. Uh, you know, uh, so, I mean, everything was different. And uh, so what, where our show turned out to be revolutionary, even though it wasn't intended to be, it was just intended to be entertaining. Uh, it was the first time we saw up until then, American television was upper middle class white, whether it was Friends, Seinfeld, Frasier, all the shows, everyone was well scrubbed white. And if you were African-American or minority, you were on one of the side networks. So or you were um, uh, uh, Cosby uh, and you were a doctor living in the suburbs. But so all of a sudden you saw a different slice of America when you watched our show, which is and everyone knows these people, you walk down any street in America and, you, you know, I've got 20 sh I've got 20 shows before I get to the traffic light. So it wasn't that the subjects were shocking. It was that it was shocking that it was on television. Do you guys think that I mean, you got uh, so you ended in 2017, it was, I believe. Uh, 18, eight. OK, 2018. So about almost 30 years. Do you think that you guys would have succeeded in today's climate? If you guys no. just started the show now. No, oh, no, 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 no. Because now there's uh, there's such sensitivity on, uh, and, you know, on what you say, on what jokes people say, how much people can be hurt by what you say. There's no way. And frankly, I wouldn't even do the show um, just because based on my political views, there's no way I would do the show in today's climate. I mean, we've I learned. Yeah. I think everybody knows, like, right, Steve as your security guy on the show. But did you go out around town with, like, your own personal bodyguard? Would you have to? No. I mean, you know, people always say that. No. I mean, if we re recognize if we went to a nightclub, for example, go out to have a drink or I like to smoke cigars or back then you could, um, you know, if you do something like that. We know people are, are going to come up as soon as you walk into the place, but everyone's always friendly. So the first two minutes you're taking camera, you're taking pictures, which, by the way, when the show started, people didn't have cell phones. I mean, the cultural mm -hmm. change that took place in our lives during the course of the years of the show is just amazing. You know, so do people you, come up to you more now because they have phones or do you think? People oh, sure. Come up? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's equal. It's equal because I'm on television every day and now I'm on with Judge yeah. Jerry. So you got the court show I do every day. Plus, you have reruns of the talk show. Uh, so it's like I've been in people's homes for 30 over 30. years. Well, exactly 30 years now. So even if someone wouldn't like the show, it's not like they haven't heard the name or don't know who I am. You know, it's that kind of thing. You become part of the. But, you know, I, I, I try to be nice to everyone I meet. I mean, I ne meet. I never, you know, say no to a picture or an autograph or whatever. You just you just do it. I didn't complain when my life was going great because of the show. I'm not going to suddenly become mean because I don't need the show anymore. I mean, that's, you know, that's foolish. Was Judge Judy pissed off? You jumped in with Judge Jerry, Double J? No, as long as it's alliteration, you can have the uh, you can have a judge show. 
<laughs> uh, but it, it uh, no, she's been very nice to me. And I've met her on several occasions. I remember years ago when I was giving no thought to having a judge show. I remember backstage, we were, when I, w- I was in her uh, dressing room, you know, her green room, and we were just, you know, talking, having some something, to, some cookies or whatever. And then she said, you know, you know, Jerry, you, you ought to do this. It's a great gig. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what? <laughs> Uh, but I love doing the judge show because it's like I'm back in law school again. I have to study the cases and I have to be serious about the decisions I make because they're not they're not appealable. In other words, when I make a decision on these cases, they can't then go to the court of common pleas and appeal it. So I, I have to take their concern seriously. Okay. okay, let's end right here. All right. Uh, three best Jerry's. <laughs> Jerry Springer, Jerry Seinfeld or Jerry Stiller. You got to pick asking? one. You. Oh, you got to pick uh, one. Oh, Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Have you ever met Seinfeld? Yes. <laughs> Best guy ever, right? Oh, he, he's phenomenal. He told me to get another first name. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thanks a lot, Jerry, for jumping on, man. Uh, is there anything you want to tell the people? What's the TikTok or whatever? If now we could just wrap it up. Thank you for your time. Yeah, or, or watch, um, you know, watch Judge Jerry mm-hmm. on every day. So. My dad's a huge fan of the show, by the way. So, super. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Jerry. for your time, Jerry. Yeah, nice seeing you guys, really. Yep, you too. Enjoy Evanston. Thank you.